Hi, and welcome to our library publishing workflows panel discussion. I'm Brandon Locke, and I'm the project manager for library publishing workflows. And I'm Melanie Schlosser, and I'm the PI for the workflows project. Library publishing workflows is an IMLS funded collaboration between Educopia, the Library Publishing Coalition, and 12 partner libraries in the US and Canada that seeks to investigate synchronize and model a range of workflows to increase the capacity of libraries to publish open access peer-reviewed scholarly journals. We started this project a little over two years ago and we'll be releasing our findings over the next few months, including the release of our workflow documentation next week. At the end of this discussion, we'll talk a bit more about our release timeline and where you can find the resources we're creating. Throughout our two years so far of interviews, conversations, and documentation, we keep coming back to the central question of roles. What role do library publishers see themselves playing in the production of a single journal, in their library, or on their campus, um, in the open access movement, uh, and in the wider scholarly communications world? Um, this question impacts library publishing workflows in a multitude of ways in that it informs core values, staffing, recruitment and selection of journals, uh, the distribution of labor between library staff, journal editors and vendors, the technologies used, and much more. Our cohort of partners consists of 12 diverse library publishing programs, and each of them has a unique approach to publishing based on the roles that they see themselves playing and the impacts they want to make. So for today's panel, we want to dig into some of these approaches and learn more about how they inform the program's day-to-day -day work. Um, and I'll, I'll just say that these are big questions and big tricky problems, and we are not going to provide pat solutions to them. Uh, instead, we're going to talk them through in public. Today we have six fantastic representatives from our partner institutions to talk about these different approaches. Um, before we get started with our conversation, um, we'll uh, do a quick round of introductions for everybody. Hi, my name is Jennifer Beamer. I am the Scholarly Communications and Opening, Open Publishing Coordinator for the Claremont Colleges. Um, my name is Paige Mon. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I work at the University of Redlands, which is a mid-sized liberal arts university. And my titles are STEM librarian, scholarly communications librarian, and quite recently, the assistant director for public services. I'm Justin Gonder, and I'm a senior product manager for publishing at California Digital Library, which serves the University of California system and I'm also a current member of the LPC board. I'm Michelle Wilson, my pronouns are she, her. I work at Columbia University in our digital scholarship division as the digital publishing librarian. Hi everyone, I'm Sonia Betts. I use she, her pronouns and I'm the head of library publishing and digital production services at the University of Alberta. Uh, I live and work in Edmonton, Canada, which is situated on Treaty 6 territory and also within the Métis homelands. Hi, I'm Vanessa Gobbler. I use she, her pronouns, and I work at the University of Pittsburgh's University Library System. My title is Electronic Publications Manager, and I'm responsible for our journal publishing programs. Thanks, everyone. Um, we are just delighted to have the next hour to talk to you about all this stuff. So our first question is one that is near and dear to all of our hearts, I know, and it's something that is always a big topic of discussion in the library publishing community, which is what is the role of library publishers in social justice and increasing access to the means of scholarly production? So um, I think this is the, you know, the first one where I have to admit I don't have all the answers because it's a very um, big issue. Um, and I think the first thing that I ha have to admit is that at least in my program and in a lot of others, I see we aren't necessarily, um, the folks that are running the program are not the most diverse crowd. And so one thing that we're sort of exploring at the moment is um, maybe we need sort of an advisory board or something like that gathered from our library and publishing partners to help us to make plans for the future, to plan strategically, um, to make decisions around our publishing program. Um, 
something we're just sort of thinking about at the moment. And uh, another way that we try and do this in our program is um, because the library publishing program doesn't really operate at a profit, um, the resources and time and effort that we uh, give to any kind of publishing project that we engage with, you know, I don't know, that's something that we're giving to a publishing partner, a new journal that wants to start with us. And so we increasingly felt like it's safe to ask for something in return for that investment. And one of the things that we do is provide a, a fairly comprehensive proposal form that a new journal project has to complete to, to kind of demonstrate that they're thinking about all of the important things that they need to be thinking about to run a journal, budget, timing, um, and editorial board makeup, um, reviewer makeup. And one of the questions that we're adding to the form right now is to get these project partners thinking about or to state explicitly how they'll ensure that there's diversity of viewpoints on their editorial boards and in their reviewer pools. So Justin, I'm I'm really in awe of the California Digital Library. Um, the Claremont Colleges are really small um, compared um, to the UC campuses. And um, we uh, have had a publishing program in place uh, since 2013. Um, we have 14 open access journals. Um, we, I think, have run much like a boutique. Um, whenever anybody has come to us to um, publish, we've been really excited and we've done everything we can to get their, um, their open access journal up and running. Um, we have, uh, as I mentioned, 14 journals. Five of them are math journals, um, which as you can imagine is really great. Um, they're STEM, um, but I think um, one of the things that we are considering and have, have put in place lately um, is much as you uh, have suggested is a program where um, we would start to look um, specifically at uh, what is the value of, of continuing having sort of this boutique style of let's um, take anyone who just wants to publish with us. Um, let's uh, get at, I think the, the fields that maybe don't have the opportunity to necessarily have this kind of alternative voice or the opportunity to publish in these spaces. Um, I think that's where kind of the value, much like you do, we, we are doing this for free. We, um, we want to show the value of library publishing. And um, I think really we need to have the stakeholders that are on the campus, our faculty, um, our librarians who are investing their time with those faculty, uh, we we really want to see kind of this system um, of open access work for those alternative voices and the and get rid of these kind of like gatekeeping um, practices um, and and as I've mentioned before to this group many times to get rid of this kind of for profit um, publishing gatekeeping oppressive systematic publishing system and I. I don't know how to do that yet, but I'm hoping that having those stakeholders that don't necessarily get to publish in um, in this for-profit system uh, get through to our open open library publishing systems. Uh, that kind of um, interaction between us can help us come up with ways of new publishing and and see kind of the alternative ways that the library can help them uh, publish. And so we, as small programs, actually, and no pressure to you, we look to the larger systems to see what kind of things you're doing. It's, it's actually very motivating to see that you're shifting in ways um, that um, are looking at your capacity and how you do things differently, because we look and see all of these, you know, all of these journals that you're producing and think, wow, we aspire to do this, but really, um, this, uh, as a smaller program, think to ourselves, like, we're never going to be able to, to do this. So I, I love talking with you and hearing the kind of the new things that you guys are doing to sort of um, scale down your operations. I'll, I'll just kind of jump on to what Jen was just saying and, and being at a smaller institution compared to the, you know, UCs and um, state 
state universities. Um, I think for a lot of the smaller institutions, if so, so at my institution, we publish one scholarly journal. And, and I think just partly by participating in this project, um, I, I feel like, yeah, just doing one is, is fine. And if other libraries are interested and able to do that, that is how we can um, just work toward more social justice and increasing the means of scholarly productions. So just, you know, if a lot of smaller libraries just do one journal, we're having an impact collectively. I just wanted to respond to the, <laughs> the, the praise, but also to say that like, you know, as we publish, I think 85 plus journals right now. And so that often puts us in a mode of just being a hosting service provider and wishing that we could do more to address these kinds of issues. And so in that way, we often take a lot of inspiration from your programs to see what you're doing with, you know, a little bit more bandwidth than we have to offer with, you know, just this small amount of staff split between that many journals. So that's um, a struggle on the other side of the spectrum, I guess. Yeah, we have a program that's, I guess, mid-sized in this group. We have about 30 journals and we have been growing and we have a, a bit of a, a growth mandate in our program. You know, we want to have more impact in, you know, open publishing and um, open scholarship, but we want to do that in a controlled way where we still maintain the relationships that we've managed to build with the partners that we have. So as we have a, a large number of student journals, um, both graduate and undergraduate, but even with our faculty partners, um, I have a very good relationship in terms of um, having them attend workshops and other educational opportunities, use our documentation library. And that kind of relationship, especially since we're on campus and we are um, uh, colleagues, in addition to being the publisher of their publication, there isn't quite the same space there is with a faculty member who's publishing with you know, a remote commercial publisher, maybe on editorial board that they don't see very regularly. And I think that that relationship is helpful in terms of creating more the opportunities for culture change through the practice that we're using on in library publishing. So I have conversations with those partners about the decisions we're making in terms of um, what kinds of analytics we're collecting and um, our privacy um, procedures and um, uh, data collection uh, has come up on like our sites this summer. And so we've had opportunities to kind of like talk about the ways that we're implementing technology or approaching, you know, ethical conundrums that we come up with. Um, and we also can give a lot of uh, information to our partners about, um, you know, author contracts and copyright and sort of getting some of that, uh, the things that are important to us, the values that we're trying to enact in the way that we're publishing, I think feed a little bit more into our partners and their practice because we're able to build those relationships with them as an on-campus body. And I think that that definitely in terms of, you know, shifting, um, uh, trying to create space for diversity and inclusion and trying to inculcate those kinds of values in our publications, asking them the questions when they're making the application, but also maintaining those relationships with them as we're going through is really sort of powerful way to do that um, as a library publisher. Michelle, I really like the, your use of the word partners because that's also how we refer to our publishing partners. And I think that's really important when engaging with some of these social justice journals because as library publishers, we're treating them as partners in a one and a conversation, trying to figure out, okay, what publishing norms do you need to learn about? And in what ways can we break ground because those norms don't fit you and what you need to do? And I think libraries are in a great position to have those kinds of conversations that for-profit um, commercial publishers are likely not interested in having to begin with. And so I think libraries are perfect in that way for, for these types of endeavors. That's actually a great transition, I think, to our next question, unless, Sonia, did you want to respond to that in some way? I think I can just respond to it in the text of the next question, if you want to move on, Melanie. Yeah, 
Yeah, sure. So our, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Brandon for our next question. Um, so I will say the next question is about a role that is sometimes in tension with the one that we were just talking about. Brandon? Yeah, um, what's the role of library publishing uh, publishers in ensuring high quality fact based scholarly publishing. Okay, so I think I've been designated as the first respondee to this question so so i'm going to just give this a try Um, I, I just wanted to say that I think um, hearing all of you speak about the the last point really to me. Um, brings to mind the fact that the kind of work that we tend to do in library publishing is uh, values based publishing instead of sort of profit motive based publishing and I think that frees us up a lot to to focus on different outcomes than maybe commercial publishers might have in mind. Um, and one of the things that I really love about the work that we do is the like the educational value that comes to it. Um, so I think that the, this question, which is um, the role of library publishers in ensuring high quality fact based scholarly publishing, um, you know, sort of looks on the outside like a question about how do we kind of gatekeep and do quality assurance with the content. Uh, but for me, when I read this question, I think a lot about what is our role as educational institutions in um, helping support an environment where we have, um, you know, uh, uh, editors and authors and reviewers um, all practicing um, ethical and, um, you know, high quality publishing practices as they move forward. And that, I think, is a role that library publishers take that other kinds of publishers don't necessarily take in their work. So we support student journals um, and a number of other folks on this call also have student journals and thinking about the ways that we're training like the next generation of researchers through that student journal experience in, um, in understanding the systems of scholarly communication, understanding peer review, understanding how uh, scholarship is disseminated and shared with the rest of the world is a really, really important piece of the puzzle um, when thinking about the whole ecosystem of high quality scholarly uh, content. So I think there's good work that we do. And we do that with student journals, but I think we also do it with editorial teams, right? Helping them practice sort of the best, um, you know, uh, standards and practices in, in publishing, teaching them about why these are important and helping with that educational mission is a really big piece of the puzzle. This question kind of gets at um, a tension that we've been feeling. I mentioned in the last question that we've been thinking about how we can grow. And I think that um, like a lot of other library publishers, we've wanted to and have been a place where people who are working in disciplines or on projects that don't necessarily have a super wide audience or are student led and therefore might not be able to work with a traditional or commercial publisher, um, we've been the home for them. But we also are feeling more and more like the way that we practice publishing and the um, the practices that um, or the services that we offer, we would like to expand to a wider group of people and to try to bring journals and people who are working on them in traditional or commercial um, publishing environments back into the academy to try to get them to be enacting or living or publishing with those same kind of values and practices. And to that end, we have been trying to think about, you know, we've, we've built up a system um, for our current publishing partners in an effort to give them, you know, as much visibility and impact with their scholarship as we can that we now can offer many of the same uh, services that someone could get at a commercial publisher, uh, analytics and um, the ability to maintain an impact factor with vendors to help produce XML so that people can publish into some of these different uh, databases. Um, and a lot of those things are um, important sort of markers of success or markers of quality that are supported by this system that was built up outside of academia that pushes people on to, into the idea that their scholarship is only of a certain value or the journal is only of a certain level of quality if it has this high level of impact and if it has all of these you know, citation metrics that are associated with the journal. In order to get you know, high impact journals to come publish with us to show that our program can help you know, a journal that um, wants to be publishing in a more ethical way and continue to support it at this level of prestige and productivity that they're currently exhibiting in this other platform, we have to participate in those systems. And that has been a bit of a tension for us because we want to be encouraging people to come over to our program 
um, we feel like we need to participate in some of those existing systems in order to get their buy-in. Um, and at the same time, those are maybe not the ways in which we would like to be, you know, as we've been talking about, defining quality. Um, and so that, that's been a bit of a, a tension for us as we think about growth. Yeah, yeah, I, I like how the second question relates a lot to the first and that I think the role of library publishers and I think anybody involved in scholarly communication models, our, our role if we are to be advocating for justice is to push back and, and redefine what high quality means um, because I think inherently increasing access to the means of scholarly production requires that we we reject you know what 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 Michelle was saying some of those oppressive systems and, and what others have been saying so so by participating we, we have like again what what Michelle was saying we, we have that odd tension um, but I think too that that our participation means that we become part of the or, or, or more deeper involved in the social foundations upon which facts are understood. Because I think, you know, we've recently, it's been really apparent that what people understand as facts are really based on who is in their social group, who are we willing to believe? And, and so I really appreciate, you know, what others have said earlier about relationships. And I think it's really about building those relationships so that we can you know have a more cohesive respectful kind high quality um, sense of what is scholarship but then also who is a scholar because I think we really have to push back on on who is recognized as a scholar and yeah so thanks Any other thoughts on that question before we move on? Okay, so question number three, what is the role of library publishing in the open access movement and the transformation of scholarly communications models? All right, um, well, we've heard a couple of times just during this call about how as library publishers were not motivated by profit in making money but that is kind of what got us into this in some ways is because the profit made by commercial publishers was really pinching our budgets. So many of the library publishers have gone into this with the idea of, you know, flipping the model to open access from those high subscription rates and, and taking some of the pressure off of library budgets. Um, and so our program, I know specifically began with this aim to to take existing print subscription journals and flip them to be open access. Um, and we, at that time, we also started taking on brand new journals at, at the same time too. We've arrived at a point in our program where there is some tension between um, flipping existing journals uh, with that initial goal in mind and a newer uh, kind of goal to allow all these new voices and, and that have not had access to publishing previously and giving them access to that voice. But we're doing all of this with the same amount of resources. Uh, we now seem to have kind of two goals to our program and are attempting to juggle and balance those. And we have not figured that out yet. We are still just taking journals and um, and we'll see where it leads us. But I imagine that uh, that's something that a lot of programs will face at some point too. Just have to echo everything that you just said, Vanessa. Um, there's, I've been in, in this position now for 10 years and there's been such tremendous change in just that amount of time. When I first started, you know, we were happy to take on any project, publishing project that came our way. And then as the UC passed open access policies, you can, we can map it on a graph, just how many titles we kept adding. And often 
most of the time without any additional resources, you know, and so we're constantly bumping up against that limit of what we can do with the same amount of resources in our program. And then we really started shifting our attention to trying to flip some journals to OA, so from, away from traditional publishing models. And then transform the success of transformative agreements has had us wondering, you know, to what extent do we need to focus on that? And our focus very much now, actually, our publishing program is on hold because we have just reached the limit of what we can do with um, the people resources that we have at the moment. But as we think about opening our publishing program again to new journals, we're really trying to strategically think about what do we do with the limited number of resources that we have. And we really are um, going to focus, I believe, on um, amplifying communities and voices that might not fit in a traditional publishing model. And plus 1000 to what both Vanessa and Justin have said. I think, um, I think again, as I mentioned before, I'm limited uh, by labor on how many journals I can support our, our library publishing uh, activities can only support so much. Um, but I think the one thing we can focus on um, as, as librarians and educators, um, as Michelle mentioned, uh, as being tied deeply to education, um, is, is educating our, our stakeholders and our partners on this system, um, how the system works and how we can have agency in the system to break it down and to make it our own and, and, um, and to really advocate for ourselves. Um, I think every day I, I feel like I, I say to myself, how can that person or <laughs> how can that faculty member have worked in the system for so long and not have realized that's how this system works? Um, how can they not know that they didn't have ownership over their work? Or how can they not know that this is how much a journal cost? Or, you know, so I think, I think we'll never, I will never give up on the, on the education. And I, I also, um, I think I've learned over my um, short time being a librarian, actually, I've only been a librarian for seven years now. I think I've learned that, um, you know, partnering with my other librarians extends my reach of education um, and teaching them about um, the ways in which the library publishes and our, you know, the way that we have agency in this, um, in scholarly communication and, and in publishing has helped me extend my reach. Um, and so I think involving them uh, in uh, you know, the social justice, in learning about how the library publishes has really extended um, uh, the role of, of my own publishing program um, and extended the reach of, of, of how we can transform this system. And often they call me, I think you, you asked me earlier where, whether I prefer Jen or Beamer or, I sometimes get called skull calm coach. I feel like I should have a whistle around my neck, <laughs> but um, I feel like that's really what, what we are is I'm not the open publishing, but I'm the skull calm coach. Um, and that's what I really feel like I need to do is coach everybody on how this system is working and um, extending that education to them is very helpful. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I think that's really our role is just to educate people on how the system is working, even if we're not publishing a journal, it's just letting people know that this is what's going on, and we we can't be held, um, you know, we can't be held in this holding pattern um, as as the system changes around us. Um, so yeah, I I'm so happy that we're all in this um, in this grant together and learning from each other because I feel like I'm being now I'm giving the whistle to you because I'm learning and being coached by all of you. It's a it's a great feeling um, as well. That was lovely, Jen. Any other thoughts on this question? Yeah, I, I think maybe just building on what Jen was saying, what Justin said, what Vanessa has said and others, um, I feel like over the last couple of years, we've really seen some individual library publishing programs sort of mature and where many of us are kind of at the state where we're like, okay, um, I feel like we kind of maxed out the number of journals we can support. I feel like we've got like, what, what next now? Where, where next for us? 
Um, and I think one of the real strengths of libraries, again, is that we're like cooperative organizations as opposed to competitive organizations. And I think we might be at a stage now where we're looking at how can cooperative action and, and collective action across, across our programs and amongst our programs sort of drive the next steps here. Um, and that, that to me is really exciting, right? Like I, our, my program doesn't compete with Justin's program for journals. We're not like, yeah, stay away. <laughs> Like we're, we are all like in this together. And I think we feel that um, sort of collective, um, you know, shared shared mission and shared values together. So I, I sort of see that as being the next big step for library publishing is, is we know there's enough like money in the system. We know that the economics of scholarly publishing have been chugging along for many, many decades. Um, how do we start sort of claiming more of that space to work in this way that we all agree is like a better way to work than, than the for-profit model? So that's sort of where, where my thoughts have gone. Uh, yeah, sorry, plus a lot to Sonia, but I just wanted to make a, because uh, this is my hat for right now an infrastructure plug because I think that's another way that we as libraries can have uh, can take collective action for the collective good and share um, resources because infrastructure is so key to everything that we do um, and increasingly it is um, owned by traditional publishers and so um, I just I think that it's really important that we work together on open source solutions to support our publishing programs. Sorry, I was a little off topic, but I think really that that is an important future direction for open access. Yeah, also, as Sonia was saying, what's next? Um, our journal publishing program is sort of the framework that we use to build our podcasting publishing program at our library. And uh, we are using the same sort of, um, ask the same kind of questions about like, how do we measure impact um you know we put our podcast in our institutional repository how do we address accessibility how do we you know all of these kinds of questions that we use when we're thinking about scholarship that's published in a more traditional modality but um part of this you know how do we transform scholarly communications is the library can also help people to publish things that aren't journal articles or aren't journals um, and i think that there's a lot to be learned from these kinds of you know, workflows projects. This was focused on journals, but the workflow that we developed at Columbia for publishing our journals helped us to publish and help our community think about publishing a different kind of scholarship and scholarly communication in a way that feels like scholarship to them and is you know preservable and we're going to be able to provide access to for a long time so i think that um all of the conversations that we're having about these more traditional modes can also help us to kind of like push scholarship into its next iterations um as well and, and libraries library publishers because we're like within the academy we often work with digital scholarship or digital humanities librarians and who are working in you know sort of different modes and softwares and types of things like that like we can be part of those sort of more cutting edge conversations about um you know what scholarly communications looks like in the future i'm thinking that that one of the roles of library publishers uh, or yeah or, or of library publishing is is to transform our own department, specifically our own library budgets, which largely go to collections, which largely go to the for-profit publishers with wrong or, or you know just like awful profit margins. And so I'm intrigued by by what some of you have been saying about kind of reaching your capacity and like. You know, so Sonia was saying taking things to the next level and you know working more collaboratively. So, so I'm just wondering, um, in terms of thinking about how how maybe we want to build infrastructure for that, like collective infrastructure. Like, do you see maybe like um, you know if, if some of your programs are like we're maxed out, but maybe you want to talk with Jen Beamer at Claremont they may be able to, we may be able to partner with them to still get your kinds of um, publishing out there. Or, or Michelle, if you're thinking about podcasts, again, we're maxed out, but she knows her stuff. So I'm just curious what you all think. 
I think some of that stuff happens now very casually. Um, I get referrals from other programs that, you know, they can't uh, support that journal for, you know, their own resources or it doesn't fit their program and that gets sent to me. Um, and I think that's something that we should do more of and, and, and tell each other that it's fine to do that because I think it benefits everyone. The, the journal publication or whatever it is finds a better home for them. Um, and it just is a better match for everyone. But yeah, I wonder if there could be some sort of um, more official structured way of doing that though. I like that, but I also think that um, one thing that I know that our shop could do better and I suspect others could as well is demonstrating the value of our library publishing programs to the powers that hold the purse strings. Um, and I just think we, we need to really figure that out. And um, maybe that's another area where we can collaborate because we are all doing such great work. We could all do so much more great work if we had one more FTE or five more FTE. And um, I'm not sure that we're always the best at arguing for those resources. Yeah, I think, I think I've always argued <laughs> I, I love when people send around on the listservs like, hey, has anyone ever put together a proposal for this thing or, you know, arguing, I wish we had a shared resource um, for those and LPC is actually uh, the library publishing coalition is great for, um, you know, sharing resources on um, MOUs and um, jobs and um, uh, publishing program documents. And I feel like we need another whole um, uh, set of documents for all sorts of things. Like, could you write a, a paragraph on the value of my publishing program? And we could all crib from those kinds of things. Um, uh, it, it would be great to start up some of the, <laughs> those areas because I, I do feel like um, articulating that sometimes is, is really hard, especially if you have um, admin who aren't familiar with, with some of these aspects. Um, so I don't know if we can all get together and start like cribbing these, <laughs> these things, if we can ask um, LPC for another whole section of their website to, um, to start storing this stuff it would be great. Um, I'm sure we've all written up a few paragraphs like this to, to ask, but. Cool idea, make a note for documentation month this year. <laughs> Any other thoughts on this last question or on anything that we've talked about so far? Okay, then I will hand it off to Brandon to close us out. Right. Well, thank you everyone for a really great conversation. Um, a lot of uh, thought provoking uh, segments in here. Um, can you share my screen again? Um, as we, um, as we mentioned in the opening, we'll be publishing our findings from the project over the next four months. Uh, next week, we'll be releasing our set of documentation from our 12 partners. The week after that, we'll kick off a series of posts on the LPC blog uh, with posts from each of our partners about how their program and workflow have evolved over time. Um, in mid-January, we'll be releasing a set of tools for library publishers to use to create their own documentation. Um, and if you'd like to follow along uh, with any of that work, we'll be sharing each of these releases on LPC's Twitter account and also on the LPC news list. Um, if you're not on the news list, you can sign up on the LPC website. Uh, you can also find links to all the deliverables we've released on the Library Publishing Workflows homepage on the Educopia website, and the link is here at the bottom of the screen. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>